Welcome to episode 49 of Mito Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I had Georgie Dinkoff back on the show, aka A Dude. That's his superhero name, the name of his website where he posts some really controversial and fascinating, insightful blog posts about various topics. Just had a really good one on quantum physics, maybe nothing but a scam slash fraud, which I really enjoyed. I think the whole quantum health thing is getting a little out of control. It's super esoteric and not really grounded in in reality. But in this interview, we talk about niacinamide, niacin, NR, NMN, NAD supplements are really big right now. I love Georgie's mind, how his mind works, how he thinks. Really, really intelligent, articulate man. And he knows a lot about energy production and hormones. So I could just pick his brain forever. And we end up talking actually about nicotine, cannabis, alcohol. He gives some recommendations on things you could do to prepare yourself if you're going to drink. He even talks about some benefits of ethanol slash alcohol. And for the second half, we actually have a pretty lengthy question and answer session where my friends on Instagram asked questions that I forwarded to Georgie and he gave some really interesting answers to them. We talked about methylene blue, pregnenolone supplementation, talked about muscle meat consumption, had a narcolepsy question, really interesting stuff. Uh, dental health. So anyway, to the interview, here is Georgie Dinkoff. All right, Georgie Dinkoff, welcome back to Mito Life Radio. Thanks for having me again. Uh, hopefully I'm, I'm useful to your audience. Yeah, they loved the last one, just the info on progesterone and DHEA. And the resveratrol rant at the end was awesome uh, about the history of resveratrol. So fascinating yeah. stuff. Uh, so yeah, this one, yeah, it's one of the it's one of the bigger commercial scams in the last ten years. And unfortunately, it's still going on. <laughs> I was hoping it's going to go away, but you can still buy resveratrol. Uh, you know, David Sinclair is still peddling peddling his his wares, and it looks like you know just business as usual. You know, just they went away for a little bit, and then it came back. Yeah, it's interesting. I have my finger on the pulse of the anti-aging community, like Aubrey de Grey and right. all of them. And it's all life extension is all focused on caloric restriction, all the opposite things of what we research and talk about. Uh, it's all about caloric restriction, omega-3 fatty acids, and resveratrol, right? The resveratrol. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's like all the opposite things. <laughs> I mean, ironically, basically, like uh, one of the mechanisms through which resveratrol potentially, uh, I mean, the, the reason the research started is that it's supposed to raise NAD levels, right? And also like activate the sirtuins. Now, the sirtuin part turned out to be the exact opposite of what should be done because like in basically many animal models, inhibiting the sirtuins actually extends lifespan. And in humans and in many animal models, activating the sirtuins leads to cancer, right? So, so that part is, is certainly bad, but like some of the stuff that the anti-aging groups like uh, Aubrey de Grey and David Sinclair do now, they've kind of shifted away from like from the sirtuins towards like raising NAD levels. And that's actually a legitimate pathway to, to extend lifespan. And ironically, um, uh, basically fasting, at least at the beginning, does raise the NAD to the NADH ratio. So, so the idea, I mean, basically, I guess the the idea is right, but they're using really like the really bad methods to to like to to get to achieve that, and, and they don't they kind of like they're kind of quiet about the side effects and the bad things that come with caloric restriction and so on and so on. Not sure if you saw my post two days ago that caloric restriction increases cancer rates by sixty plus percent. Um, so uh, ironically, the the animals at least in that study did live a little bit longer. So it's like so it's like yes, I mean it looks like you you're you have some kind of a good idea, right? With the caloric restriction, but you, you you try to like sweep away under the carpet like the really the bad side effects, which is getting more cancer, and you only try to sell the like, hey, it's, you're gonna live longer, right? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know if you see in the news, but uh, many many public health officials are now saying, look, it's not worth extending lifespan if it's if you're gonna be a vegetable for the last 20 years of your life, right? So we should be extending health span in in addition to lifespan. 
And if all you guys are doing is extending the lifespan by making people fast and feel like crap all the time, well, guess what? I'm sure somebody will take you up on this offer, right? But that's not really what we're after. Like we should be extending, like basically being alive and being a human being, a functional human being for as long as possible. Um, and that's not what the current, I mean, that's not what the community really has achieved yet. And and I, I don't see them achieving anytime soon, unless they actually shift away and start thinking about energy and, and all these other you know, components of, of actually having a, a longer and healthier life. That's well said. Yeah, I, I'm i really interested in radical life extension without going the transhuman route, just like the most natural radical life extension methods. I'm just obsessed with that. And ever since I discovered Ray Pete's information, just this different, bi- like the bioenergy kind of metabolism view of, of human health, it's totally shifted my perspective on anti-aging and my strategy, what I, how I live my life. And so one question I had, I'm curious, I used to take NR, nicotinamide riboside, and there's all right. these companies selling like NAD that's really expensive, but you can just take niacinamide in, if you take it in high enough dosage, the extra will actually switch over into NAD. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. So here's what happens. Like the reason you don't want to, be, not that you don't want to, but like the nicotinamide riboside, I think the, this company Chromadex has a patent on it, right? So you're going to be, if you try to buy nicotinamide riboside right now, the prices are ridiculous. Um, and one of the reasons is because the company is doing research and, of course, it's promoting this molecule, right? Um, and then there's another, there are three precursors, actually four, to NAD. One is niacin, right? But in order for niacin to turn into NAD, it has to first go through a step of niacinamide. So there's really no point taking niacin. If, if your goal is to raise NAD, you might as well go one step closer and take the niacinamide. Now, the selling point for Chromadex so far has been is that, well, look, in order for niacinamide to get converted to NAD, it has to pass through the step of nicotinamide riboside, right? And then from that point on, it has to become nicotinamide mononucleotide, right? So the best, really, the best step, the closest you can get to NAD is taking nicotinamide mononucleotide. Hugely expensive, almost impossible to find, but there are companies that actually are trying to kind of like upend Chromadex and say, Guess what? We can get even one step closer, and we we're gonna take this to market, and we're gonna eat, we're gonna eat your market, guys. But all of these people, if you actually look at the studies that that looked at taking nicotinamide riboside and mo- nicotinamide mononucleotide, it shows that as soon as you ingest these nutrients, because they pass through the stomach, they immediately get hydrolyzed because of the stomach acid back to niacinamide and whatever extra component is there for the nicotinamide riboside. That's that's the ribose, which is a type of sugar which we naturally produce from eating carbohydrates. So there's plenty of D-ribose in your body. So taking nicotinamide riboside orally, all it does is basically immediately breaks down to nicotinamide and and D-ribose. So there is no extra benefit taking nicotinamide riboside to taking pure nicotinamide, niacinamide, because you already have plenty of D-ribose inside of you. So taking the niacinamide is just as effective as as the nicotinamide riboside, and they actually did studies comparatively to see which one raises NAD more. And nico, nico, nicotinamide riboside bested niacinamide by about 15%. But that study was sponsored by Chromadex, and their own study said the difference was not statistically significant. So now keep in mind those 15%, the data was probably fudged just to get NR to come out a little bit on top, right? But even even their their sponsor study could not get away from the fact that the difference was not statistically significant. But guess what? The price is very much statistically significant, the price difference. So you might as well stick, stick with niacinamide. Now, the nicotinamide mononucleotide, there's a lot less, there, there are a lot less studies about it, right? Um, I don't know of any comparative studies between, the, the, the abbreviation is NMN, right? Nicotinamide mononucleotide. I don't know of any comparative studies between a- NMN, NR, and niacinamide. I only know of studies comparing niacinamide and NR. So by now we know that niacinamide, might as well take niacinamide, they're cheap and about as effective as, as NR. And on top of that, the NR actually activates the certain genes. And that's actually one of the selling points for chromatids. They say, hey, look at David Sinclair's research. You know, they, you know, if you take NR, you're going to raise it, your NAD levels and you're going to activate the certain genes. We don't want that actually, right? I mean, we, we actually want raising NAD levels and, and, you know, maybe not inhibiting the certain is too much, but but at least not activating it. Um, and the reason we don't want them to be activated, the reason they're associated with cancer is that apparently fatty acid oxidation depends on activated certain genes. 
So this means that in somebody who actually with, with already established cancer, certain inhibitors of which the most potent no one is nicotinamide, but not NR and not NMN, they actually are probably therapeutic for cancer, unlike these two, right? So the two expensive ones. So you have every reason so far, based on the evidence that we have, you have every reason so far to use plain niacinamide and not bother with all the crap that's been out there, it's been promoted. Um, I mean, of course, I'll, I, I'll, I'll look at their research. I mean, these people are spending money on research, and unless it's obviously fraudulent, they actually produce some good data. They showed in one of the studies, they administered two dose reg regimens. One was 250 milligrams of NR daily, and then the other one was 1,000 milligrams of NR daily. And after 24 hours, they looked at the levels of NAD. Both doses raised the NAD levels by, by about the same amount which tells you that there's probably a saturation thing going on. The enzyme NAMPT, which, which is responsible for, for synthesizing NAD from precursors, it probably can only handle that much precursor on, on a 24-hour basis. And the 250 to 300 milligrams daily just happens to also be the dosage that Ray Pete has been recommending to people for niacinamide. Um, higher doses would probably be beneficial, but for things like cancer, right? Because after you saturate the enzyme, and you cannot get any more NAD, and by the way, raising NAD is therapeutic for cancer as well, right? Then the rest of the, of the niacinamide will stay as niacinamide because it builds up, right? It cannot be metabolized, so it builds up. And niacinamide in its pure form, in its non-metabolized form, is known as the most potent certain inhibitor uh, cl in clinical use today. So yeah, lower doses, great for prevention, great for metabolic, uh, for accelerating metabolism, great for all of these, for like potentially even losing weight, uh, but it, when it gets to some serious diseases, like especially cancer, um, and actually there's a clinical study with Alzheimer's, I think I mentioned it last time, using three grams of niacinamide daily. And and since the anything more than 250 milligrams is not raising NAD, then the only thing that we can uh, surmise from the study with humans is that this high dosage has some other beneficial effect. And I can immediately tell you that it's likely to be this inhibition of excessive fatty acid oxidation. Alzheimer was recently proposed to be reclassified as diabetes of the brain. And diabetes, we already know, is related to excessive fatty acid oxidation. So clearly, if you take something that inhibits this excessive fatty acid oxidation, it's likely to have a beneficial effect on that brain condition associated with excessive fatty acid oxidation. Aspirin works about the same way. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you look at the evidence available so far, zero reason to spend your hard-earned dollars um, on these expensive expensive products that are heavily marketed, right? Uh, there is some science behind them, there's no doubt. But the argument presented so far that, that basically says, take ours, more expensive stuff, versus the dirt cheap thing that you know you can buy from any store, that those arguments really don't hold much weight if you look at them, if you look at the evidence. That was awesome. Um, have you looked into nicotine? Because that's that was big in the biohacking community. I recently even saw my, my cousin who's had the nicotine vape pen and I'm not a fan of that. I think the vape pens are pretty dangerous, but I used to grow tobacco and then make my own little paste out of it with honey and chocolate and different things. That's kind of fun. But nicotine is really closely related to these other compounds, right? And that kind of gives tobacco right. its famed anti-aging effect a little bit. Right. Uh, so nicotine does have some benefits. Uh, basically, it is a very powerful aromatase inhibitor. Um, and there's another component of tobacco leaf called cotinine, C-O-T-I-N-I-N-T. You can look it up. It's an even more powerful aromatase inhibitor. And it's been shown that people who smoke have a naturally higher level of androgens and naturally, I mean, I should say natural, they have, they have on average higher levels of androgens and lower levels of estrogen. Um, so this is this may be one explanation of why, you know, people smoke. It just gives you this boost and, you know, keeps your hormone, hormonal balance, you know, more positive than, 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 you know, if you weren't smoking. It also, it's been shown that people who are under stress tend to smoke more. Uh, if you look at poorer countries, countries where life is really hard, they, they tend to have a disproportionately higher number of people who are smoking and drinking coffee. So they, they're calling coffee and cigarettes, they're calling like the poor the poor man's survival kit, right? They're widely available. Um, I mean, and basically they give you this extra boost that, you know, people think like they need. Uh, nicotine also is, is a little bit dopaminergic um, and actually smoking cigarettes even more so. So there's something in, in addition to the nicotine in tobacco that, that combined gives this like this uh, synergistic pro-dopamine, anti-estrogen, pro-androgenic effect. Unfortunately, if you don't use like a good filter, uh, smoking tobacco also give you a lot of these carcinogenic hydrocarbons, aromatic hydrocarbons, 
And I think that's one reason why Pete has been against smoking when people ask him. You know, I mean, he, so he said, yeah, sure, nicotine can have some benefits, but I wouldn't use it too often. And I think one of the reasons he doesn't speak directly in favor of nicotine is that nicotine is actually a, an adrenergic receptor agonist. And also, and also um, uh, nicotine, clearly nicotine receptor agonist, right? So it's the, so the nicotine is basically activates the acetylcholine system in the brain. Um, so it, in higher dose, it can actually be excitotoxic. And the fact that it activates the adrenergic system, right, it can get you into a, an adrenaline dominant state. So uh, I think many smokers know that if they smoke without, you know, drinking their coffee or eating something, you know, uh, shortly after, their hands start to shake and tremble. That's from the that's from the elevator adrenaline. So clearly there are good there, there are some benefits. There are also some risks, right? So, but the fact that tobacco has, is used throughout pretty much every culture that we know of uh, on this planet and has been found in archaeological artifacts to be used like 4,000 years ago, clearly there are benefits in there and people people for people who know how to use it. Um, so yeah, I think every once in a while, you know, uh, and I, I would say that smoking regular cigarettes is probably less harmful than smoking weed. I know weed is all the craze right now, but weed is heavily estrogenic, heavily serotonergic, and and heavily anti-androgenic. So it's um, it's no. And the recent the, some recent studies show that uh, weed actually increases the synthesis of pregnenolone in the brain because pregnenolone blocks that cannabinoid receptor that weed activates. So it's kind of like the body apparently treats smoking weed as as, as kind of like a toxin, right? So it it, it it musters up this hormetic response and then generates extra pregnenolone to keep to keep the weed effects under control. So many of the benefits that people report from smoking weed could very well be due to the increased synthesis of pregnenolone, which smoking weed triggers. But it triggers pregnenolone synthesis for the wrong reasons. It's like the body says, oh my God, I'm under assault. You know, I need to uh, I need to defend myself and then let's synthesize some more pregnenolone. So it's really the pregnenolone that it's kind of like similar to the wrong idea of Aubrey de Grey and, and, and David Sinclair, you know, they're giving you resveratrol, which raises NAD, but for the wrong reasons, like the body's trying to get rid of it, right? So similar similar thing here. So if you're going to smoke, I would say so go with the regular cigarettes. Make sure they're not the commercial variety because they have ammonia. They have a number of different flame retardants, uh, almost all of which are carcinogenic. At the very least, they're, you know, they're toxic to the liver, uh, kidney, and, and often to the brain as well. So if you can roll your own tobacco or smoke from a pipe, and then add like put like an activated uh, char carbon filter. They actually sell them. You can buy on Amazon an activated charcoal filter for cigarettes and pipes. That would probably decrease dramatically the risk of side effects from smoking while still giving you all of the benefits. I love that. Or cigars, right? Cigars, and yeah, or cigars. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, so while we're on the topic of all these things, so we hit cannabis, we hit <laughs> coffee, all these different things. I'm curious your thoughts on alcohol. I don't think we really talked about it in the last one. My friend Adam Bergstrom has made some interesting posts on Facebook about the beneficial effects of alcohol. And I'm not condoning, you know, alcoholism or whatever, but right. I think low dose can have an effect on lipofuscin that's positive and exactly. right? decreases the accumulation. Exactly. Did he mention that? Or he may have gotten this from me because that's that's exactly. one of the few <laughs> chemicals known that actually can 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 dissolve lipofuscin and get it out of the cell. But it's really tricky because you like basically the if you look at the studies, the, I think it was an animal study. The the beneficial the benefit the beneficial amount of alcohol amounts to about a drink and a half per day, right? That means like anything more than that started actually increasing the accumulation of lipofuscin because alcohol has this effect on like increasing lipid peroxidation, right? It depletes glycogen, so it will trigger the stress response. Anything that triggers stress response. It ultimately gets into like a increased lipolysis. It starts reacting with iron, right? And that's what that's really what lipofuscin is. So, so yeah, li alcohol by itself, actually, pure, pure alcohol, the pure ethanol, um, it can have some good effects depending on the dosage. Alcohol itself, ethanol, is actually a, a GABA agonist, and it's also uh, an, an antagonist of the receptor NMDA. And a powerful NMDA receptor known as ketamine was currently was is already approved as a rapidly acting antidepressant. Actually, that's why people abuse ketamine, because you can cure your depression temporarily within minutes of, of doing either a shot of ketamine or the intranasal drug that they just approved. Um, so alcohol actually has a very rapid antidepressant effect, and it's probably why people like drinking it, one of the reasons. Um, you know, the GABA, basically the GABA effects of alcohol lead to disinhibition, 
uh, that reduces anxiety, right? A lot of these things that people, it's not a coincidence that people under stress drink more. It's its all about self-medicating, right? So if you, so the GABA agonism lowers cortisol, the NMDA receptor antagonism basically, you know, kind of resolves your depression, at least temporarily. The GABA agonism basically also relieves anxiety, right? The combination of these two lead to like a, a general feeling of well-being because you're no longer stressed, you know, or at least you don't react to stress, right? You're kind of forgetting it. Uh, alcohol is also amnesic, speaking of forgetting things, right? Um, and, uh, and last but not least, alcohol has been shown to increase the synthesis of allopregnanolone in the brain, which is another neurosteroid, which FDA also recently approved as an antidepressant. So all of these things like, are actually good, right? Now let's talk about the bad, like alcohol by itself, the actual molecule of ethanol is also a, an agonist of the endotoxin receptor, TLR4. Definitely not a good thing, right? Now, but in order for it to actually activate that receptor, and it, that receptor is mostly expressed in the intestinal system, in the gastrointestinal tract, you have to drink enough alcohol to actually build up, right? So if you're drinking a drink or two per day, most people with a healthy liver will quickly metabolize that alcohol and it will, it will not lead to that inflammatory reaction. But if you're abusing it, if you're drinking it every day, if you're drinking it in amounts, you know, more than your liver can handle over the next two, three hours, you are allowing alcohol to activate the endotoxin receptor. And that receptor is has wide reaching systemic pro-inflammatory effects. It immediately leads to, to increased serotonin synthesis. It immediately leads to increased release of nitric oxide it actually activates the phospholipase enzymes that start synthesizing prostaglandins, leukotrienes, thromboxanes, um, you know, um, uh, I think lipoxins, all of these things that are derived from arachidonic acid, all of the inflammatory mediators that are derived from arachidonic acid, the, the alcohol activates the enzyme that metabolizes arachidonic acid into all of these inflammatory mediators. <clears throat> and, last, sorry. and last but not least, alcohol activates, acts as an agonist of the 5-HT3 receptor, which is the serotonin receptor most highly expressed in the GI tract and the brain. And you basically, <clears throat> there are, there are 5-HT3 antagonists, such as ondansetron, uh, you know, basically granisetron. There are a number of different drugs that are approved for treatment of nausea, but they also have been found to be rapidly acting antidepressants because the serotonin, as we know by now, is actually a pro-depressing chemical. And serotonin antagonists are known to act as antidepressants. And the 5-HT3 receptor is expressed most highly two places, GI tract and brain. And depression mostly stems from these two places. Actually, many people think that depression is mostly about the brain. It's not. Actually, the GI tract plays a huge role. And alcohol activates, unfortunately, this receptor, pro-inflammatory, pro-depressive, um, in both the GI tract and the brain. So it's all about the dose. You know, in this case, you know, if, you, if you're not abusing alcohol, it'll treat you well. If you, that's that's really your go-to drug for like feeling better and you're abusing it, I mean, just like anything else, over time you're gonna pay the price. It's funny, I'm sure you're familiar with like Bulletproof Coffee and Dave Asprey made like a like an alcohol roadmap or something of like the best to worst alcohols. And I think one of the better ones was tequila and wine. And I think wine is is often talked about. I drink it here and there. I've definitely I definitely take months and months off of it, but. The resveratrol in it is not enough to be a super poison, right? I mean, it's not like taking resveratrol no. supplement, but no, not uh, at all. Actually, resveratrol is a tiny amount in actual wine, uh, and it's one of the selling points for David Sinclair has always been like, hey, yes, it's in red wine, but you have to drink 15 bottles of wine to get to that level. Thank God, it, it's not you know in an amount in wine that would make us worry, you know. So it's like it's really other things in the in the wine that uh, that are found. It's mostly the phenols. Like red wine is very rich in phenols. And phenols have a potent antibacterial effect in your gut. Um, they're basically, they can get converted into quinones, these oxidative molecules that help speed up metabolism. Uh, many of the phenols are actually anti-estrogenic as well. So it's really, those are the benefits of red wine. Uh, it's not the resveratrol. And, and you know, obviously it's not, it's not the sulfites that they use in both red and white wines as preservatives. So you don't, sulfites are very dangerous thing. Uh, Pete released a newsletter recently it was about the sulfites and saying that they can actually trigger a lethal allergic reaction even in people who don't have like allergies to sulfites. It's really they're really dangerous they, uh, and it's they can actually trigger like a like a lethal asthmatic reaction in people with asthma and also in people without asthma. So apparently asthma is not something that that's like a disease that you either have it or don't. You can actually trigger an asthmatic symptom 
depending on what you eat and what you ingest. So yeah, so wine, maybe one glass is going to be okay. But if you're going to be drinking alcohol, um, it's probably better if you go with the, the clearest type of alcohol, vodka or like spirits, um, because beer is highly estrogenic. Um, but on the other hand, beer has brewer's yeast, right? So it's got a lot of B vitamins, right? So trade-off between the estrogenicity of beer and and basically like the good the good is in it. And in wine, it's basically it's it's uh, it's got resveratrol, which is estrogenic, right? It's got a number of other phytoestrogens, but it also has got phenols, which can be anti-estrogenic, right? Um, and and they have a number of different pro-metabolic effects. So it's really it's almost like a tug of war. Um, depending on, it's only the purest alcohol that that basically only the ethanol, which is in vodka, right? Only that alcohol you can kind of be certain of what it does in your body. Everything else is a mixture of so many different chemicals that uh, you know. In in general, you don't you don't want to mess with them. I mean, beer is known to be estrogenic, right? Um, and wine less so, but still, a red wine is also known to be estrogenic when abused. That was awesome. Yeah, I know a lot of people soak their steak. I, I recently got a grill. My dad bought me one. <laughs> and uh, they soak it in, in whiskey or bourbon. And I think my friend introduced me to Jefferson's Ocean. It's like bourbon that's aged at sea for months and months. And so the, the ocean minerals actually get infused into it, which I thought was pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's that's a problem. I mean, basically, bourbon and vodka are probably the, the, the purest alcohol you can drink. Um, they're, they're not known to be to be estrogenic by itself. Uh, but alcohol is, is like every alcohol, it shifts the redox balance towards reduction. So the best, so one of the good things you can do before or after drinking alcohol is try to raise the NAD to the NADH ratio. So some niacinamide, right? Some methylene blue, some thyroid, uh, or an anti-serotonin drug, like a serotonin antagonist. Not many people know, but there is like a, there, there is a, uh, they call it the party bus. So if you go to Las Vegas, they have this basically bus, which it's it's really it's like a massive bus. It's almost like a truck. And and what they have is is there are about ten doctors inside, right? They're actually licensed, and you can go inside and get like a anti-alcohol treatment, like if you really you if if you overdid it and you don't want to get checked into a hospital. So the the what this anti-alcohol treatment consists of is an IV which has in it sugar, B vitamins, and the anti-nausea drug on dancitron, which blocks the effects of that serotonin receptor. How you know how how brilliant you know brilliant you know they they figured it out. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically like uh, so so you know this that's <laughs> you can get the street in Las Vegas, but if you're at home and you don't have access to all these things, I think at the very least you can you know the very least you can do is take a little bit of niacinamide because you know it helps you metabolize the alcohol faster and shifts you away from that reductive state, which really isn't isn't beneficial for you. That's fascinating stuff. I think that's really practical information because I think there are a lot of purists or people that might even pretend like, oh, I never drink or do any of this stuff. But, you know, we're human beings and we live our life. And so I think it's really important to have those those little things that you could do before to prevent. Um, let's let's jump in the Q&A. Um, someone asked uh, dental health. Yeah. What certain things can impact saliva and the oral microbiome? And they're just curious your thoughts on dental health in general. So for a long time, people thought that, you know, like the, you get poor dental health because of like the foods you eat, right? If you eat a lot of carbs, that's going to give you cavities, right? And there's some, there's some truth to that, right? But it's not nearly as much as what the dentist would, would have you believe. Now, it's been shown that people who, who brush and who floss regularly and go and see their dentist, they don't have uh, like a fewer amount of cavities per capita. They're actually about the same. So which, which speaks to the fact that, that dead, poor dental health or a good dental health is probably something a result of something endogenous, like an endogenous process, right? Not so much what you eat, even though that that, that matters as well. And then older studies, if you look at older studies, you'll see that um, basically dentists were, were able to prevent and even reverse periodontal disease by simply giving their patients either antibiotics or laxatives. So it shows you that dental health is actually intimately tied to your intestinal health. And it's been known for a long time that bacteria in the gut can actually translocate and move to different areas of the body. And it's been shown that people with really poor gum health, um, like in periodontal disease and in general poor dental health, two things are almost almost always seen invariably in these people. Number one, um, bacterial overgrowth, gut dysbiosis or whatever you want to call it, like basically either SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and or uh, the increased bacterial overgrowth in the colon as well. Number two, low carbon dioxide levels. 
Um, post, I posted a study about five years ago at this point. I mean, I remember because when it was really striking, so I remember it to this day. And it basically showed that elite athletes had really poor dental health. And everybody, and like, I thought, like, that's crazy. How can they see why poor dental? They're, they're like the epitome of health. Yeah, but apparently not. You know, that's just because the image that's being sold to us is that they look good, right? And they're fast and, you know, they could do all these cool things. That doesn't necessarily mean their health is fine. Uh, and actually, the vast majority of competitive athletes, especially the one at the Olympic level, like a world champion level, their their health really declines after their career, like their active career ends, um, even if they continue to be involved in the, whatever sport they were doing. Michael Phelps is actually probably the best example. Not sure how many people know, but Michael Phelps is a really, really serious alcoholic to the point of getting alcohol poisoning a number of times getting busted for DUI at least five times. You know, he would have been in jail by now if he was a regular fellow. But, you know, the state of Maryland doesn't want to throw in jail. It's, what is it, 12-time Olympic gold medalist today. So it's like he's been in treatment. He's been in rehabs. I think he's been also involuntarily hospitalized a number of times because of mental illness on top of the alcohol abuse. So it's like you can – but if you look at him, on, you know, if you look at him on the on, the, on TV or at, during interviews – You'll say it's just a normal guy, right? I mean, he looks like a regular, presentable guy. Well, imagine how many, um, how many, how much drugs he needs to take just to appear that normal. I mean, I know people who know him personally, and they say he's not a pleasant drunk. Like he would have like two beers, and then he'll start looking for a fight, right? So all of these things, and and I know some other elite athletes. I went to Georgia University, which used to be known for its for its basketball team. It still has a good basketball team. Still has recruits, right? Um, many of these people basically like. Um, some of the ones that I went to school with and then they graduated and went to MBA and then retired, I mean, their life without exception actually took a massive turn for the worse. And most of the reason was actually poor health. You know, yes, sure, they had some poor spending habits. Yes, sure, they made some bad decisions every once in a while. But the the one overwhelming thing that, that affected them all was that their health was actually pretty poor. Like uh, many of them already had, had destroyed their spines and knees uh, you know, towards the end of their career in the NBA, which is like early 30s, right? Things like that. Um, many of them actually already had, already had cardiovascular disease or at least diagnosable signs of it while still in the, in the NBA. So all of these things show you that, you know, the, just because you're an, you're an elite athlete, extreme performance and results doesn't mean extreme health. In fact, if anything, the, the, the correlation is probably negative. It's like the, the opposite, right? The more extremely you push yourself, the more the more you're pushing your health towards toward towards the bad, um, and basically th that study showed that it was actually it was poor thyroid health and low carbon dioxide that that was seen in all of these elite athletes with really poor dental health, um, and and it makes if you think about it, it makes perfect sense because we know that carbon dioxide is vital for for the formation of the bone right um, and teeth are just another type of bone. So clearly, if you're going to have low levels of carbon dioxide and low levels of thyroid hormone, you're going to expect to have problems with your bones. And But not many people think of the bones of the teeth as bones. They think they're thought of like a separate system, right? But they're just as effective. And it's not a coincidence that people with very poor dental health also already have very poor skeletal bone health as well. Uh, many of them have osteopenia, which is thinning of the bone. And actually, it's a precursor to osteoporosis. Um, some of these people already have had like, uh, you know, a number of different bad fr fractures. It's, I think most people know that this is happening in athletes, right? Um, but not many people think of it as the result of their poor health. It's more like, oh, well, these people are pushing themselves to the extreme. Of course, they're going to break a bone. Um, there are other people in, you know, in, in positions that are just as dangerous and, and pushing themselves, like let's say elite military special forces, right? They don't suffer fractures at nearly the same rate as elite athletes. So there's got to be something endogenous health-wise that's happening with the athletes. And the evidence so far shows is that basically because they're pushing themselves through the stress system, adrenaline and cortisol, over time they're suppressing their thyroid. And if your thyroid is not working well, carbon dioxide production will fall and all of the bone protective steroids will fall as well, while cortisol will basically will like, you know, will, will, will reign unchecked. And cortisol, just as catabolic as, as it is for the bone, you can immediately see why it would be catabolic for the teeth as well, right? But again, if you talk to your dentist and, and say, hey, does cortisol play a role in dental health? You'll probably get a blank stare. Some people will say, hmm, yeah, I guess it makes sense. It's just, it, it is another type of bone, so it should. 
but most dentists don't study that. There, there aren't that many courses. I don't think there's even one course that talks about stress and dental health because the the, the presumption is that it's it's your diet and your genes, right? Um, and then and then you know whatever that is, and that it can be fixed by the dentist. But it really should be thought of as a sign slash symptom of declining systemic health, which manifests itself in the decline in dental health as well. That was well said. I would imagine cell phone use plays a role too, because the non-native EMFs, that decreases bone density. So putting that right up to your skull and your teeth probably isn't a good that's, idea. Yeah, that's huge. And uh, if you have actually any any of the older amalgam fillings, there was a study which showed that even like a brief exposure to Wi-Fi, uh, even if you're standing like 10 feet away from your router, or brief exposure to, an, to the EMF from the phone, right? And most people have keep the phone much closer to, to their body than the Wi-Fi router. And by the way, not, not many people think about the fact that your, your phone, your, your cellular phone is actually like a, a big walkie-talkie. Uh, I'm sorry, a flat one. But its power output is measured in watts. Well, the, most of the routers are milliwatts or at most one watt. So actually, if sitting 10 feet away from the router, which is weaker than your cell phone, can cause the leakage of mercury from these amalgams in your teeth into your saliva and your bloodstream, then imagine what your cell phone will be capable of doing. Now, thankfully, not many people have these anymore, I think, but I still, still a significant minority does have at least one filling that, that's based on mercury, um, and that's pretty bad. Um, and so to them, that's, you know, anytime they get exposed to an EMF, they're probably getting like a, you know, decent shot of mercury in their bloodstream. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything positive about mercury when it comes to living organisms. Yeah, I've heard of a Mexico, uh, a Mexican dentist that puts in quartz or amethyst. And mm -hmm. I, I, th I, I decided if I have to have a feeling, I would do that, quartz or amethyst, because those right. are more natural uh, minerals. <laughs> um, yeah. so, someone's asking the proper way to dose progesterone to lower estrogen. And this is, you know, with the caveat that you're not a doctor. <laughs> So in terms of lowering estrogen, they mean like uh, opposing it or like lowering its synthesis or... Yeah, they don't specify, I guess, wh wherever you want to go with it. Uh... So it, depends, it really depends on like how bad the estrogen excess is. Like basically when, when, when both men and women before, are before puberty, they produce about the same amount of progesterone, which is about 25 to 30 milligrams daily. That is a physiological dose. Now, but they don't produce as much estrogen before puberty as after, right? So, so I would start with the lower doses, like the you know 25 to 30 milligrams daily, and see how that affects people. And if it works well, then there's probably no need to increase the dosage. But if somebody has like, if it's a male and has gynecomastia, or has like a, you know poor skin health, poor libido, uh, irritability, uh, trouble sleeping, all of these things are sign of excess estrogen. Then, uh, then I would I would say a dose is probably as high as 100 to 200 milligrams daily may be needed. And keep in mind, even that's considered a pretty low dose. Like uh, they're, they're selling these pills called Prometrium, which are it's just progesterone dissolved in oil. Um, and basically, like the typical pill in, in, in this packet is 200 milligrams of progesterone. So they consider that a regular dosage, and they give this to women when they when they test low on progesterone on their blood test. So so it's really not that big of a dose. But for males, um, you may need they may need to add a little bit of an androgen as well, like a DHEA or you know uh, or even testosterone, because progesterone in very high doses can actually have a like an anti-androgenic effect in the sense that it competes with the um, with the with testosterone for the for access to the enzyme 5 alpha reductase. So so basically progesterone it has a higher affinity for the enzyme, so you'll prevent testosterone from converting into DHT. And, and you know, if your DHT levels drop, you know, enough, then you may have, you know, a few symptoms of, of you know, lack of lack of androgenic effects. Uh, some people have reported, you know, numbing of the penis. Some people have reported, like, shrinkage of the gonads, right, things like that. So in order to prevent that, usually adding a little bit of pregnenolone and or DHEA helps. Um, five milligrams of DHA is probably perfectly fine, and you know, 10 to 30 milligrams of pregnenolone is probably is probably enough. Um, but yeah, for opposing estrogen and or inhibiting in synthesis, if it's a high estrogen situation, I would say 100 to 200 milligrams daily is, is what I would try. That's awesome. You actually answered one of the other questions: how to prevent progesterone from turning into estrogen. <laughs> so pretty much, pregnenolone and DHEA kind of add that to the mix. And yeah, and also progesterone is not very likely to turn into estrogen because in humans 
progesterone, in order, in order to get to estrogen, progesterone has to convert into something called androstenedione, right? And then androstenedione can get converted to estrone, which is one of the estrogens. So it's so it looks like a, just a one-step thing, right? I mean, progesterone, androstenedione, and an estrone, and be like, oh my God, maybe if I take too much, you know, uh, if I take too much progesterone, it'll convert, it will raise estrogen because it is on the pathway. It's that's not how it works in humans, because that pathway it's called the delta four pathway. Basically, in humans, um, we don't synthesize many steroids through it. The, the, the humans synthesize androgens and estrogen through the delta-5 pathway, which means DHEA. So you can certainly give yourself estrogen excess by abusing DHEA, but it's next to impossible to raise your estrogen levels by taking too much progesterone. It's just not going to convert. And by the way, when you, since you've taken all this progesterone, right, it actually is, is an aromatase inhibitor itself, right? So it's going to kind of inhibit its own conversion to estrogen even if a little bit of it started converting, you know, down that pathway. So it's next to impossible in humans to abuse progesterone to the point where it's starting to raise to, to raise estrogen. It may lower androgens because in very high doses, progesterone inhibits the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis, right? So it's kind of, it can suppress you just like an anabolic steroid can, right? But again, in 100, 200 milligrams daily, you probably, you probably, it's not that much of a worry. And best of all, Adding the pregnenolone and DHEA can actually prevent that suppression. That's awesome. Yeah, I think Danny Roddy recommended to dissolve DHEA powder, and I yeah. got the, the I think Ona's Naturals progesterone oil. And it's just fun to play with. I notice it's just a tool in my toolkit. If I feel extra stressed, or I have an extra stressful day, or an event happens, then I could take some, and I do feel a definite reduction in stress. So that's not all I do, but it's one of the tools I use. So. It works really well. Yeah. Um, someone's asking, what would you recommend in trying to heal the knee joints after Lyme disease? They said topical methylene blue or DHEA. Uh, depends what they mean by healing. I mean, do they suspect that there's still like the, the, the parasite is still there? I mean, if that's the case, then if you rub, you're going to rub anything, you might as well rub a solution of doxycycline or like a tetracycline, right? I mean, because it, it will absorb and it may have, you know, direct effects there. In terms of inflammation, and potentially, you know, joint damage. I think actually progesterone DHEA combination is the best you can do. Both of them have powerful bone anabolic effects and anti-catabolic as well. Both of them are powerfully anti-inflammatory. Um, DHEA is specifically very important for connective tissue, not just for bones, right? So basically they will help for the joint, but there's also cartilage there as well. And there's some soft tissue as well. There's some, there's some tendons, right? For all these things, DHEA is hugely important. So progesterone DHEA combination, rubbing there is, is what I'll try. That's awesome. Um, this is an interesting one. Husband is XXY. I guess that's his chromosomes. So he doesn't produce testosterone. Doctor has to give him this the injection every 10 weeks. Any ideas on how to help boost uh, his testosterone? Right. Help boost simply testosterone or help boost fertility? Because, I mean, clearly if he's on testosterone, then he's already getting it, right? Uh, and if, if his testosterone production is genetically pretty determined to be low, I mean, there's very little you, you can do there, right? You can try giving some precursors, but, you know, um, if, if, if that's, that's just how his body operates, I mean, I think getting the testosterone exogenously is probably not a bad idea. However, um, it has been shown that testosterone by itself is not enough for fertility. I recently posted a thread which showed that it's most likely pregnenolone, which is the primary fertility steroid in males. Um, back in the early 20th century, when they were doing, when they discovered pregnenolone, they did a lot of tests with it. They thought it was inactive. And then Hans Selye and a number of different people who actually did direct research with pregnenolone and its effects on health basically came to the conclusion that if pregnenolone has any role by itself without converting to anything else, it is probably related to its role in protecting the male gonads, the testicles, from the from the toxic effects, from the atrophic and shrinking effects of estrogen and cortisol. So there are actually, there were actually clinical trials with pregnenolone in a dosage between 75 milligrams to 200 milligrams daily orally to treat male infertility, and they were highly successful. Of course, you don't hear about that because around the you know, 1960s and 1970s, they, at that point, they already knew they had managed to isolate the gonadotropic hormones, the human chorionic, chorionic gonadotropic hormone, HCG, right? And then these became all the rage. Now people get injected with those 
because they stimulate the pituitary and then consequently they, the expectation is that you're going to be producing you know more testosterone and you're going to be fertile right but it turns out that it's actually pregnenolone which is the primary fertility factor in males at least protecting the gonads or enabling them to function well so if he's already getting the testosterone injections i would actually add pregnenolone to that um, as little as 50 milligrams a day that you should make a huge difference and potentially protect the gonads because testosterone by itself can actually have some some negative effects especially in a high dosage on the gonads as well Older studies show that pregnenolone protected the gonads from both testosterone, not, not both, from testosterone, estrogen, and cortisol excess. Wow, wow that's super cool. Um, what's his take on muscle meat consumption, and where do you recommend getting the majority of protein for optimal health? I don't see anything wrong with muscle meat consumption. I think it just shouldn't be overdone because it's very rich in tryptophan, cysteine, and actually, and, and probably even methionine. So uh, if you're eating muscle meats, I would add a little bit of gelatin. I think that's probably the best way to balance it. Just eating a spoon of gelatin with each of the heavy muscle meat meals is probably going to be enough. Um, also, muscles are very high on phosphate, and they have a very, very uh, high ratio of phosphate to calcium. And in general, phosphates inhibit metabolism. So, so you, you, you want to try eating foods with higher calcium to phosphate ratio. And I think that's one of the reasons why Pete recommends dairy. So if you're taking calcium supplements, then I don't see any problem with you know using muscle meats as like a, as a major source of the protein, provided you also do a little bit of gelatin just to just to offset their inflammatory and anti-thyroid effects. I love it. Um, this is probably the most interesting one. I I don't know if this is a joke. I hope not. But <laughs> I just got diagnosed with type two narcolepsy. I need help. I'm sleepwalking through life. Is there any solution besides stimulants? Um, but actually, the fact that the stimulants work, I think it, it immediately shows you most of the stimulants are dopaminergic. So it shows you that narcolepsy probably has to do with, with basically a, a, like a low dopamine or at least like a low dopamine to serotonin ratio. So, you know, doing things that can boost the dopamine. I think what some older studies show that ingesting the amino acid tyrosine actually can help uh, control this condition even without drugs, right? So you can try the, uh, the combination of branch chain amino acids and tyrosine or phenylalanine, and I posted about this on the forum several times because they tend to lower serotonin, and phenylalanine and tyrosine are precursors to dopamine. So you can have like your poor man's Adderall at home just by using this combination of amino acids. Um, caffeine, I mean, clearly, I'm not sure, sure say clearly. Uh, I know it sounds like an obvious solution, but many people think of, ca of caffeine as a stimulant, but caffeine actually is a dopaminergic nutrient. So it's not so it's the stimulation from caffeine doesn't come from like a direct excitement of the nervous system it's because it releases the brakes on 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 producing on releasing dopamine and it the caffeine achieves that by inhibiting adenosine and adenosine is a sleep promoting receptor right so caffeine inhibits the adenosine receptors and that allows to it keeps you in a in a, in a much more awake state so um so caffeine combined with the bca and tyrosine may work even better uh, it also, anti-serotonin drugs can be tried as well. You know, if you can get access to cyproheptadine, it is a little bit sedating in the first week, right? Uh, and in some people, it can actually be, be quite sedating. But this miraculously wears off by like the end of the first week to the point where after that, people have been taking 32 to 64 milligrams of cyproheptadine, and they walk around and they feel perfectly fine and and they don't get sleepy. They actually feel full full of energy. That's interesting. Have you ever heard of modafinil or provigil? That was like yeah. big in the biohacking community for a while. I mean, they're 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 still like in the same class. Like many people, they take the provigil was you know the story of provigil was invented for military pilots uh, by the U.S. Army uh, because they wanted these pilots to be awake on like 80 to 90 to 100 hour long missions. They would basically send them on these nuclear bombers during the Cold War, right? That's where provigil came from, and they wanted these pilots to be not only awake but to be functional as well. So they were looking for a drug that would allow them to do that, and that, that's how Pro Provigil, uh, you know, came to life. It was a it was a direct development of I think of DARPA actually, and then it became you know it hit mainstream, and then people took it and started selling it and and promoting it for other conditions. But it originally it was an actual truly like a stimulant drug, <laughs> keeping you awake no matter what happens outside. <laughs> Whenever I hear DARPA, the hair stands up. Like GlaxoSmithKline is another one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my alarm bells go. 
I, I would venture I guess that GSK is actually more evil. <laughs> <Because laughs> GSK bought bought the reserve truck company from David Sinclair, you know. So they 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 have no qualms of you know about killing people. DARPA, <laughs> they fund projects that kill people, but they also fund projects that are supposed to make people healthier. Well, I don't think the same can be said about GSK. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. They're heavily on the killing people side. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, his thought, what are your thoughts on extreme menstrual pain, cramps, and possible link with prostaglandins? Um, again, I mean, just they, I think they already, they've already hit the nail on the head. Prostaglandins are heavily involved in, in both uterine pain and the heavy menstrual bleeding. So uh, aspirin clearly helps, right? It's many, many women use it over the counter for that, for that reason. Um, but actually, progesterone is really also a very potent inhibitor of the COX enzyme. So progesterone not only has direct protective effects on the on the uterus and on the reproductive tract, but actually it's an anti-inflammatory as well. Um, and I think Pete has been recommending progesterone to women specifically for heavy bleeding and pain for painful periods. Um, that's that's because he said it's one of the few things that are likely to have a systemic beneficial effect. Other, I've heard also good reports on cyproheptidine. Um, and even though cyproheptidine thins the blood and may make a person more prone to bleeding, it also happens to be a potent anti-inflammatory and blocks the effects of estrogen both because, both by blocking the histamine system and by blocking the, uh, the, the cholinergic system. So estrogen cannot exert an effect without these two systems being activated. So if you take a drug that's anticholinergic and antihistaminic, you effectively block an estrogen. It becomes almost benign. I mean, it's got other things that can cause, that can wreak havoc, but it's not nearly as dangerous, you know, if, if you if you if you leave it unchecked. And cyproheptidine just happens to be blocking both of these two systems and the serotonin system, which is heavily involved in in fibroids, in inflammation and pain. Of course, you know, um, it, it doesn't matter if it's in the reproductive tract or somewhere else. So, pretty versatile chemical. Uh, if somebody doesn't have progesterone, doesn't want to mess with hormones, antihistamines is what I would try next. Benadryl. It's probably a good over-the-counter option because it's got the anticholinergic, it's got the antihistamine effects, and it's got a fairly decent, not as potent as cyproheptinin, but it's still got a fairly decent anti-serotonin effect as well. Interesting. Wow. Um, you mentioned aspirin. So that was it for the Q&A. Just before we wrap up here, I had a question about aspirin. I've been dissolving it. I can't remember who I heard that from. It might have been Danny, but dissolving aspirin tablets in hot water, and I found that they don't fully dissolve. And the whole idea with there was so you don't have to drink, you know, all the excipients in there. Right. Um, I use Jericare that just has cornstarch, and I've just been popping them as an experiment whole. I know it's probably not the best, but I don't really feel a negative effect from the cornstarch. Any thoughts on that? Like how how you dose aspirin, or because it, it, it seemed like the tablets won't fully dissolve no matter what in hot water, right? Actually, actually, I mean, because some of it is starch, right? So, so you, mm -hmm. you you don't expect the starch to dissolve. But the um, so I also use Jerry Care. So if you mm -hmm. want, you can actually dissolve probably two tablets per glass of warm water. So two tablets per two hundred and forty milliliters. They should dissolve, like minus the starch. The starch is not going to dissolve. Um, so so basically, other than that, I mean, um, you can try. You can actually buy pure aspirin powder. But look, aspirin is not very soluble in water. It's actually more soluble in alcohol and more soluble in oil. It's not a very hydrophilic molecule. Um, so you can you can actually try to buy sodium salicylate or magnesium salicylate. These are the magnesium sodium salts of salicylic acid, which aspirin gets metabolized into. And that's basically a more water soluble version of aspirin. And those dissolve pretty well in water. Um, warm or cold, it doesn't matter much, but they're much easier to dissolve. And you can do, you know, you can put like, you can make a much more concentrated solution. So that's what I would try. And actually, magnesium salicylate gives you magnesium as well. So it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good uh, alternative to regular aspirin. Um, I mean, other than that, uh, like I said, you should it should dissolve. Just don't overdo it. No more than two tablets per one glass. Um, and then even if it, even if they don't dissolve, just chewing them before ingesting and making sure you don't use them on an empty stomach usually is good enough. Um, and if you, uh, another option for helping dissolve is when you put the aspirin uh, tablets in water, add a little bit of baking soda, right? Because it's going to react with the aspirin and kind of force it to dissolve and, and it will become sodium salicylate. So you're actually creating this, this sodium salicylate at home. If you don't feel like it, you can buy it online. You can buy it by the pound. It's pretty cheap. Um, I prefer magnesium salicylate, but it's harder to find on the open market. 
That's really interesting because the water I drink, my filter injects sodium, calcium, potassium, and magnesium bicarbonate, mostly magnesium bicarbonate. So that my water is already saturated with that. So I must be creating some some cool compounds there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. And, and like basically, yeah, all the bicarbonates help. Um, it also, they also protect the stomach from like some of the irritating effects of, of aspirin. Some people have pretty pretty sensitive stomach. Some people have gastritis, right? So so if some people have GERD. Um, so it, to them, like they they fear aspirin because they say, oh, it's it's gonna it's gonna you know it's gonna make exacerbate my symptoms. It's gonna make it much worse. For those people. Adding, taking aspirin with the bicarbonates or adding a little bit of gelatin or glycine seems to fully prevent any irritation on the, on the GI tract. That's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate the tips. I've, I've been having some shows about aspirin. And my friend Ben Belty is kind of like a rewilder, ancestral health type, type of guy into hunting and foraging, good herbalist. And he was talking about the ancestral use of aspirin in the willow tree and how we used to eat more wild game, you know, deer, yep. bison, elk. And now we're eating all this domesticated, you know, beef. They don't, they're not eating the willow tree. They don't have these aspirin compounds in them. Precisely. Precisely. And, and people were actually using the willow tree directly, right? I mean, the Native Americans were using it. Most cultures around the world have been found that, so basically salicylic acid, not many people know, but it's actually, it's a hormone in plants. And it's a hormone, plants actually treat it as a hormone and it has hormonal effects. It's the hormone of protecting yourself from bad things in the environment. Any type you hurt a plant, any type like a herbivore grazes on a plant, any type a plant, any time a plant is attacked by a disease, it immediately ramps up its synthesis of salicylic acid because it's the cardinal protector in the plant world, and it's it seems that it's the same thing in, with humans as well. That is that is super cool. I feel it. I also feel just an energy boost whenever I take aspirin, and it's so cool that it's affordable. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I stay away from Bayer and, you know, the, the bad companies. But, uh, yeah, it's a cool little trick. So um, awesome, Georgie. I think this was great. And uh, we we got through all the questions. Um, just, to, I guess, if just two minutes or three minutes on this vitamin D. Uh, I get a lot of questions about the correct vitamin D level. And my current understanding is most people are magnesium deficient. So to add D on top of that, especially orally, right. can cause a lot of issues, right? Uh, yeah, and also like basically uh, some people that have that carry extra weight, they find it harder to raise their levels. It has been shown that the reason is basically just they just carry extra mass, so higher doses are needed. But you know if they persist, so typically two to three thousand international units daily seem to be enough, right? But for people who carry extra weight, about five thousand units daily are needed. I prefer the daily regimen versus the uh, the weekly one. Because like the doctor will prescribe you the weekly dose, which is fifty thousand units, right? And that can actually some can sometimes cause problems with like hypercalcemia. Um, so the, taking it on a daily basis at a lower dose, it's actually much more, much less risky, and it, it will achieve probably the same effects in terms of raising the levels. That's awesome. That makes sense. Yeah, I started using my vitamin D lamp again, the Spurty, and uh, that's cool. There's two minutes front and back, and that's given me like a sunburn before. It's, it's very powerful. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Awesome, Georgie. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. Stay on while I close out the show. Thanks so much. All right, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. What do you guys think of that one? I found it really interesting. I love controversial topics. I thought... The part about ethanol being an agonist of the endotoxin receptor was really interesting. Um, Also that alcohol increases allopregnenolone in the brain. Really interesting stuff. You don't hear about this often in blog posts or in the alternative health community. I also loved what he said about coffee and cigarettes being the poor man's survival kit. That's so true. Nicotine and caffeine can definitely be band-aids or if someone's in a relatively healthy state i think they could have benefits but it's all about finding that balance right i think the practical logical starting place is water emfs light magnetism getting these departments down getting food frequency down saturated fat animal protein eating carbs eating sugar frequently This is the foundation of health. And then your body can start to come back into balance hormonally. 
when you're not restricting cholesterol. And remember, stress burns through cholesterol. To detox your body, you burn through cholesterol. So there's not only the magnesium burn rate, what about the cholesterol burn rate? No one ever talks about that. How fast we're using up our cholesterol to make steroid hormones or steroidal hormones because we're burning through those because we're chronically stressed because of iron overload and lipofuscin overload, which causes chronic systemic oxidative stress. So when you have chronic systemic oxidative stress, you burn through your hormones like crazy. I believe that increases cholesterol requirements. This is why I live an animal-based lifestyle and I promote an animal-based diet. Definitely not a fan of carnivore. I think that's a way to wreck the adrenals and liberate tons of PUFA from the tissues with all that cortisol. Plants are okay to eat here and there. There's definitely benefits to potatoes and fruit. That's well proven. Fructose is awesome. And if starch is well cooked, especially dextrinized potatoes, slathered in unlimited butter, that's my dinner a lot of the time with a cup of bone broth, potatoes, butter, sea salt, bone broth. Awesome meal. And that's a really easy one. So check out Hey Dude's blog. It's heydute.me, H-A-I-D-U-T dot me. I'll put the link below. And he just has awesome articles. Really, really fascinating stuff. A lot of cool stuff on aspirin, which is kind of a suppressed tool that, a lot of people can use specifically diabetics that's that's proven in the literature to help with diabetes specifically and a lot of other things. I use aspirin as a skin tonic, a digestive aid, and an anti-stress, and also an aromatase inhibitor tool. So that's the main four reasons I use it, but there's many more. It's really countless what acetyl salicylic acid does. I'm gonna have a whole episode just on aspirin alone coming up here. So Stay tuned for that one. If you want to support the show, mitolife.co, that's my brand of products. I currently have five. And thanks for your patience with the Black Friday sales. Got a little behind there. Uh, it's, it's me at the helm alone, one man show here. So appreciate your patience. If it takes a while for the order to get out or for me to respond, I do my best. But I really appreciate the support. I can't express how much I appreciate it. I really put a lot of energy into these products and education about these products and stay tuned for, for more. I actually have a couple more products in the works, maybe more, and I'm going to keep building out my life because it's fun for me. And it's not about getting you on 50 different supplements. It's about having a tool in your tool chest so that you can use that tool when you need it. And my website, matt-blackburn.com, that's kind of the hub. You can find my YouTube channel through there, my Amazon store of recommended products, and all my recommended products right on the website where I have discount codes for all of them. And I'm constantly updated it. I just put the Gemba Red full body light on there. Andrew Latour is an awesome guy. He builds really affordable red light devices. And there's a huge debate. I think whenever someone is making money, it's just human psychology, or maybe we've been programmed that way, to think you could do it yourself cheaper. I used to be in that mindset. I'm not in that mindset anymore. I like to pay people good money for good services or good goods. And so that's the deal for me with LEDs, LED red light therapy. It's not as strong as a 250 watt heat lamp like I have a YouTube video from three or four years ago. It's not comparable. LED red lights, and I'm, I know I'm going off topic here, but I like to rant. LED red lights are more powerful than a 250 watt Dr. Wilson style heat lamp because with that heat lamp, you're mostly getting infrared. You're getting one, two percent maybe of the visible red light. You're not getting this huge intensity of 630 nanometers, 660 nanometers which are the ones that you really want. You want the visible red. Infrared's beneficial, definitely. Near infrared, mid infrared, far infrared. There's three parts of the infrared spectrum. 
But I feel the visible red, the red you can pick up with your eye, the red that we can perceive, that has a huge benefit to the system. So I think people going to Home Depot and trying to DIY it, that's fine. I started there. Go for it. I think you know, a $50 setup is better than nothing. But is it comparable to these red LEDs? Absolutely not. And I'm speaking from experience and from my research as well. So light therapy is something I'm passionate about. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. People just trying to cut corners. They don't want to spend the money. They think it's a ripoff. And there are a lot of companies that are marking up their lights to insane prices because they have basketball teams on it, football team athletes using it, et cetera. But companies with barely any marketing, without a marketing team that's not running ads like Gemba Red, I think that's a good company to support. And I like supporting small businesses. So that's a lot of the companies I have on my website. I'd say 90% of them, maybe 99 are small companies where it's family run or it's just a handful of five people or less running the company. I think that's cool. A lot of people in the industry that I've connected with in the past, unfortunately, the vampire types just build a business just to sell it. And to me, that's, that's kind of demonic in my opinion. And so I don't think if you're trying to help people, you should build a business just to eventually sell it to investors and retire in Iceland or whatever in your, you know, Rudolf Steiner cabin. I don't think that's the way to go. So yeah, I'm in it to help people and let's support good people that actually care and aren't just trying to make a buck and throwing together the whole kitchen sink. I don't like taking supplements with a billion things in it. That's a red flag. I like taking individual supplements and when supplementing, that's a big tip because a lot of people that have reactions to supplements you're taking something with 10 things in it 15 things in it of course you're going to have a reaction especially with the dosages especially if it's liposomal because if there's any toxins in there or allergens the liposomal or my cell formula or whatever they want to put the marketing term on it it's all bs anyway but that brings all the toxins into the cell easier different things to think about you know the dosages of the ingredients in my opinion i think people are on the wrong supplements in general the best ones to be on are magnesium shilajit vitamin e and systemic enzymes and then maybe some other ones that are kind of individualized but those are pretty broad that everyone needs in my opinion (laughs) So today's quote is by Georgi Dinkoff from his quantum physics article. I have always suspected quantum physics as being little more than a mathematical smokescreen. The overly complex mathematics and the fact that many of the theory's propositions are so bizarre have resulted in quantum physics becoming an esoteric discipline in which only the chosen ones are allowed to work, question, and develop further.